Okay. That's why I can link together the um, video and the sound afterwards. I need a clapperboard room. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody. We'll start with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for bringing us together today. Lord, may you, the warmth of your presence be with us. And may your word, may your word shine in our hearts. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable to you, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Right, we're going back to Acts today, where I'm supposed to be. Um, I want to go to, to the book of John to start with, though, and the words of Pontius Pilate. I've just turned over one page. So we're going to John 18. And this is a important thing, I think, in the Bible, and important for the book of Acts as well, what is said here. Uh, so John 18, and it's 33 to 38. Pilate, therefore, entered into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this of your own initiative? Or did others tell you about me? About me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and your chief priests delivered you up to me. Um, what have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were this world then my servants would be fighting that I might not be delivered to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Pilate therefore said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everybody who hears the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? What is truth? Um, the <coughs> politicians recently, in America and in this country, I think the expression, what is truth, is springing, springing to our lips more. What is truth? Let's go to Genesis, chapter 1. Or sorry, chapter 3, sorry. Um, most scriptural principles start from Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. Famous words. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field and the Lord, that the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has the Lord said, You shall not eat the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the tree of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat, for in the day you touch it, or even touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. Has the Lord really said what is truth? And what I want to pull out from the, uh, this particular section is one of the purposes for the book of Acts. Under there, there's a, uh, a saying, make the lie big, keep it simple, Keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. Mm. I have seen that attributed to Adolf Hitler, to Hermann Goering, though interestingly a Jewish website that I looked at said there's actually no evidence that it came from either of those. And as they've got a, an axe to grind in that case, I, I probably trust them. But that's how the world works. Mm. That's how American politics works, and British politics, and... Arabic politics and every other politics in the world make it lie, keep talking it, keep saying it until everybody believes it. Go to Luke chapter 1. It's 1 to 4. This is, if, if you think of the book of Luke, it is part 1 and Acts is part 2. They're, they're the same book basically. There's part one and part two. So I'm taking this, this particular section here as replying to both books. This is Luke speaking to Theophilus and saying what the purpose of these books is. In so much as many have undertaken to compile an account of all things accomplished amongst us, just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses 
and servants of the word have handled, handed them down to us. It seemed fit to me as well, having um, investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write out to you in consistent order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. What word have you got there? Have you got the word truth there? No yeah. truth. Things, I've got. The exact things. Mm. The idea of the book of Luke and the book of Acts is to let Theophilus and whoever's reading it know the truth of what's going on behind things. And you say, well, what, why doesn't they just believe? If someone comes along, one of these apostles comes along and tells you something, why don't you just believe them? How many of you would just believe somebody if they come and told you something? I want to tell you some of the things that people were hearing. So what Theophilus would have heard, what other people in the Roman Empire would hear. So if we go to Acts, and the last chapter, 28 of Acts, this is Paul. He's now in prison. He's now been brought to the... Um, to Rome, he's in, under house arrest in Rome, and he's called together the, the Jewish leaders to talk to them. Because Paul's principle was always go to the Jew first, then the Gentiles. So he wants to talk to the Jews' leaders first. And it's interesting what the Jewish leaders actually reply back to him. Um, somebody else want to read this one for me? It's 28 and it's 20 <coughs> to 22. It might not relate to other versions. <laughs> I asked you to come here today so that we could get acquainted and so I could explain to you that I am bound with this chain because I believe that the hope of Israel, the Messiah, has already come. They replied, we have no letters from Judea or reports against you from anyone who has come here, but we want to hear what you believe, for the only thing we know about this movement is that it is denounced everywhere. So this isn't even from the Jews. The Jews are hearing rumours from the Gentile world that this particular movement, this Christian movement, is denounced everywhere. And what, what are they being denounced for? If we go to Acts now, there's a whole list of them. Acts 17. It's 5 to 9. This is what was... The, the Gentiles were accusing Paul and others of doing. Then the Jews became jealous and taken amongst them wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in uproar. And coming to the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. But they did not find them, this is Paul and Barnabas, and began dragging Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, shouting, the men, um, the men who are upsetting the world have come here also. Have you got a different translation of that? Upsetting the world? The men have caused trouble all over the world. Yeah, we've got all over the world. In the old, in the old authorised, it's upside the men who are down. turning the world upside, upside down, down have come here also. Uh, 17 again, 16 to 18. Paul has to make a quick exit from that particular place and he ends up in uh, Athens. Then he ends up preaching in Athens and he gets dragged before the Areopagus, which is the, um, was the parliament and now a sort of talking shop. Um, so it's verse 17. Someone want to read this? Seven, seven, uh, sorry, chapter 17, uh, 16 to 18. And while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also came the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idol babbler wish to say? Others, he seemed to be proclaiming of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Preaching strange deities could get you killed. Interestingly, in the Roman Empire, there were tens of thousands of gods. 
Every household had their own God. Every well had its own God. Every business had its own God. So it wasn't merely the, <coughs> the gods who sat on uh, Mount Olympus. There were thousands of them. But to preach a strange God who get you killed. <laughs> but anyway, that's... The way the Roman Empire worked was you could worship any god you liked as long as Caesar was your chief god. And so you had to pray to Caesar as your chief god. Above Zeus and above all the rest of them, to Caesar. And along they come preaching Jesus and the resurrection. That could get you killed. 19, Acts 19. <clears throat> a riot in Ephesus caused by a bunch of silversmiths who were so concerned about the glory of their God that they started a riot oh yeah, right um, 23 so 1923 at the same time there arose no small stir about that way for a certain man named Demetrius a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of the occupation and said, Sirs, ye know about this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, we see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, is Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that, that they have been no gods, which were made with hands. Is that the last one? 30. So that not only this aircraft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all of Asia and the world worship. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul, companion in travel, they rushed with one accord to the theatre. <coughs> and when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. Mm -hmm. So obviously reading between the lines there, they didn't care about uh, Diana. They cared about their trade. Okay. Money, money, money. <coughs> The next one, Acts 21, it's a Jewish riot this time. It's a Jewish riot. So these guys cause riots wherever they go. They're causing riots in Ephesus. They're causing what they called riots in Lystra, I think it was. Um, so these are the rumours that are spreading around wherever they go. And now these Jews go to Israel and they cause a riot in Israel. So 21, uh, 27 to 30. And this is, Paul has been gone to the apostles. The apostles have actually said to him, look, prove to the Jews that you are not a, a, a lawbreaker. Prove that you follow the law. Do this for us. Follow these uh, religious steps, the steps of a Nazarite, and show to everybody that you're a good Jew. And so now Paul's in the temple doing what he's been asked to do. And when the seven days were almost over... The Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up the multitude and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and, the place, uh, and this place. Besides, he has even brought a Greek into the temple and has defiled the holy place. For they had previously seen Tropius, the Ephesian, in the city with him and supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. And all the city was aroused, and the people rushed together, and taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the door was shut. When you read the book of Acts, you find there's riots everywhere, caused by the Christians. And they're condemned criminals. That's there, though. If we go to the beginning of Acts, chapter 4, actually, I'll, I'll just tell you which ones these are. So if it, where it says Jerusalem... Uh, Acts 4 that's where Peter and John had gone to pray in the temple and they had the audacity on the Sabbath I think it was to cure a lame man and that lame man was leaping and dancing and praising God 
And so Peter and John and the lame man were dragged before the, the Sanhedrin as lawbreakers. And they couldn't work out what law have they broken. I don't know, but don't do this again. You've been very naughty. Go away. Later on, the, the disciples are once again dragged before the same Sanhedrin. And beaten up this time. And this, that's where Gamaliel says, leave them alone. Don't do anything to them. And if it's nothing, it'll end up going away. But they still beat them up anyway, just to be on the safe side. So, I mean, these guys are lawbreakers. They keep getting in front of the courts. You go to Lystra. And that's where Paul had the audacity to cure a lame man. Who did that one? Uh, this, uh, this, that was Peter. Oh, sorry. This is Paul. Paul had the audacity <laughs> to cure a lame man in the marketplace where he'd been preaching. And everyone thought, oh, Zeus has turned up. This is Zeus and Hermes. Great, this is come. Let's have a celebration. Let's get, every, get a down that's sacrificed to them. And they run around going, no, stop it. It was by the power of Jesus, not by the power of Zeus, this man has been raised. They end up being beaten up. Paul gets almost stoned virtually to the point of death and chucked out. Once again, criminal lawbreakers. Then we go to Philippians. You know, Philippian jailer. So these, these people, they, they turn up and they, they drag. Um, I think it was a case that there was a, a demon-possessed woman that in this case Peter, uh, uh, Paul, cured. Because he was fed up with this demon-possessed woman following after him all the time. And he turned around and chucked out the demons. And because the demon-possessed woman made a lot of money for her, her owners, because she was a slave, they get chucked into prison. Beaten up, whipped, chucked into prison. The next day, very quietly, after a minor matter of an earthquake and things like in the middle of the night, <laughs> along come the, um, the, the, the rulers of this place and say, just let him go quietly. It doesn't matter. And what does Paul say? If we go to the Acts 16, uh, 35 actually, sorry, so 1635. And when day came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen saying, release those men. And the jailers reported the words to Paul saying, the chief magistrates have sent to release you. Now therefore, come out and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly without trial, men who were Romans, and they have thrown us into prison. And now they are sending us away secretly? No, indeed. But let them come out and bring us out themselves. One of the reasons for the book of Acts is to show the truth behind each of these situations. So if you've just heard these men are criminals, they've been in prison in Jerusalem, they've been in prison in Philippi, they've been in prison in Lystra, they've been beat, they're, they're criminals, they're turning the world upside down. Here's Luke saying, well, here's the truth. This is what actually happened. Yes, they were put in prison. This is what happened. They were put in prison unjustly. They were beaten unjustly. They were treated unjustly. So this is what he's trying to show in the book. One of the other things that <coughs> Theophilus may have heard about is Christian infighting. Like it would happen in the church nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to one, 1 Corinthians, actually. Sorry, 1 Corinthians. If you want to know what a, a church in trouble is, go to Corinthians, both, both of Corinthians, 1 and 2, and here's Paul, uh, verse 10 to 13, anybody would like to read that for me? So chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians 10 to 13. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united through, through thought and purpose. For some members of Cleo's household oh, have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, I am a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollo. And I follow Peter. And I follow only, G only Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were you baptized? Is the name of Paul? Of course not. Where you have a group of people, you will have factions. And we, I mean, we all have our preferred teachers. There's some teachers we like, there's some teachers we don't like. There's some that we can understand, there's some that we can't understand. Um, all these people they're talking about here, Paul, Apollos, Peter, all 
basically teach the same thing, but they did it in different ways. But here in Corinthians, there was this argument between them. There was another group of people. Um, Acts 15. What we call Judaizers. There were those people who wanted to take Christianity and make it a, an addition to Judaism. Or you might say Judaism in addition to Christianity. But they wanted to put the two together so that both sets of regis- legislation had to fix together. <coughs> and there was quite a, a dissension in the early church between these two groups of people. Um, so if we go to Acts 15, 1 to 2. And some men came down from Judah, and they began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. That circumcision is to accept the whole law, by the way. That's the idea there. It's more than just a one part of it. It's to take on whole aspects of the law. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and to the elders concerning this issue. In the early days of the church, you had these two groups. Obviously, those who were set up in Jerusalem, who were of the sect of the Pharisees, etc., were probably far more interested in taking all the Old Testament law and plugging it into Christianity. And Paul and obviously Barnabas are here as well. They're fighting about it. This is a a struggle that would have come to the ears of Theophilus. Theophilus. So, once again, Luke is here trying to explain what happened. With Apollos, I've got underneath there with Apollos. One of the things that um, this this chap Apollos, who was a... I think he was, whether he was a Greek Jew or a Jew um, living in the Greek world, I don't know. He heard the, the message of the kingdom as John the Baptist was preaching. And he heard that in, uh, in the, the Gentile world. And he became a follower of John the Baptist. So he was going out and preaching. And he's a brilliant preacher. Um, uh, Martin Luther, the, the German chap, actually thinks he's the one who wrote Hebrews. Because we don't know who wrote Hebrews. But there's no tradition to say it. But he was a brilliant preacher. He was someone who could win people over. And a lot of people would follow him for personality alone. And he was going around preaching and he converted a whole load of people to John the Baptist preaching. Later on, he meets some friends of Paul who says, well, yeah, good, but there's more. And they teach him about Jesus and he becomes a Christian and he starts from there. Unfortunately, along comes Paul and meets all these disciples that he's converted who we only believe John the Baptist. And so Paul reconverts them. And so you can imagine the rumours. Yes, Paulus was preaching, but Paul had to come on and do the job properly afterwards. Which, once again, Luke said, this is what happened. This is why it happened. And Apollos would probably shake his hands afterwards and say, thank you for doing that for me. Otherwise, I'd have to go around and do it all again. So, once again, this is the truth that's being brought out here. There's plenty of other arguments, though. Peter and Paul. Peter, the, 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 the head of the church, came to Ephesus, I think, at one of, the, one of the places, was enjoying time with the Gentiles, and he wasn't following the regulations until along came some really serious Jews. <laughs> and suddenly he started having to be very good again. Problem is he did it publicly in such a way that he pulled out and pulled out from all these Gentiles who were having a wonderful time with him. Suddenly he pulled out. Uh, uh, no, we can't do that. Sorry, we're good Jews. And Peter had a real good go at him. Or sorry, Paul had a go at Peter. In front of everybody. Because the sin had been in front of everybody. So the, 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 the rebuke was in front of everybody. That rumour got round. Peter and Paul had an argument. Paul and Barnabas had an argument. That's a good one. Uh, Acts is warts and all, by the way. It's not, it's not covering things up. On the first missionary journey, they took John Mark with them. John Mark skipped. Well, as soon as they got to Cyprus, whether he got homesick, whether he got fed up, whether he couldn't take it, he went home. John Mark was Paul uh, Barnabas's nephew or something like that, or cousin. On the second missionary trip, 
Barnabas wants to take him again. Now, Barnabas uh, was known as the son of encouragement, the son of exhortation. He was one of those people who, the, the mission is not about the mission as such, the mission about is the people who go. Have you ever seen one of those um, missionary things that we send people off to Africa to help build a, a, a wall, build a toilet, build a school, and the people in this country will get lots of money to get them out to Africa to make the, the thing out there? Now, have you ever thought, hold on a minute, wouldn't it be a lot easier to collect the same amount of money, to give it to some workers out there, they make the thing at probably half the price, probably doing it better, you're putting money into the community, and there's money left over at the end. But of course, those type of missions are not actually really for the people you're sending them to. They're for the people you're sending. You're changing their lives, you're teaching them you're opening their horizons. And that was what Barnabas was thinking the second time he wanted to take John Mark with him. John Mark's got to have another chance. He's got to be brought up. So the mission to Barnabas was John Mark. But to Paul, no, the mission, that's where I'm going. This is the front line. You do not take novices into the trenches on the front line for a battle. He's gone out once. We're not going to risk it again. And who's right, who's wrong? In some ways, both of them are right. Both of them are right. The mission is different. You would not send a, someone from university on a gap year out to do charity work in Gaza. <laughs> send them to charity work where they're less liable to get killed. What Paul was doing was very likely to get you killed. So in, once again, you have this argument between them. It's a serious argument. And it splits them up as a friend for a while, at least. But here's Luke's recording it. This is what happened. This is why the argument happened. Oh, James and Paul. James, the brother of Jesus, and we believe, who was the head of the church in Jerusalem. He's arguing with everyone. Yes, he's arguing. This is, this is stuff. Go, go to Romans. Go to Romans. <clears throat> Romans three twenty-eight. Here's Paul. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works or the law. By faith have you been saved through grace, not by works that any man should boast. Now let's go to the book of James. James is supposed to be the half-brother of Jesus, by tradition. He was also known as James the Just, um, because he was highly regarded by the Jewish people because of his upright life. That he was killed by the high priests. And here's what James writes. So, uh, James chapter 2, verse 18. And here's James, here's what James writing. But some, someone may well say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. There was a, an argument in the church. Faith or works? It's still there today. In the Catholic Church, works are higher up than faith. In the Protestants, you would say faith is higher up than works. And there's this balance between them. In fact, if you read these two, they agree with each other. Paul and, Peter, or Paul and James actually agree with each other. But there was this argument. Do we have to follow the law? Or no, can we be completely free? In fact, Paul says at one stage... We were accused of saying, let's go out and sin, that grace may abound. He said, if we were teaching that, then that would be a just argument. But we're not teaching that. We're not teaching that. And James is basically saying, if you say you've got faith, but your faith doesn't change your life, and I can't see the change in you, then it's not faith. It's the same thing from different directions. But you can see this argument. And so, in the book of Acts Luke is trying to say, this is what the argument was. This is where it was coming from. This is the tensions that were going on. You will notice one name, you've already noticed, that's causing all these problems and all this grief. Who was it? Paul. This Paul guy. He's causing all the grief. Um, Pauline Christianity. Have you heard that expression before? Say that again. Pauline Christianity. It's... Um, back in the 18th 19th century, there was a group of German theologians, um, 
So you've got that picture of that guy there, Ferdinand Christian Bauer. He set up a school of theology. They're supposed to be Protestants, but as far as I can understand, their main idea was that they didn't actually believe the Bible was the word of God. And they had something they called higher criticism, which always makes you worry when someone talks about that type of thing. Higher criticism. <laughs> but as far as I can work out, they were taking the text of the Bible as if you didn't believe it, ripping it to pieces, and putting it back together. And one of the people who was in this particular school of theology came up with the idea that Paul had recreated Christianity, that his writings had changed Christianity, and that it wasn't the teachings of Jesus. And that there was a battle between these two groups for hundreds of years, and eventually when the Pauline Christianity won, they rewrote the Bible a bit in order to make it seem that they all agreed. And so they claim that half the book of Acts wasn't written by um, Luke. It was written at a later stage. Half the, the epistles of Paul were written by somebody else, one of his followers or something else. I think this was the same group that went for the Old Testament as well. The book of Isaiah, they said, OK, it wasn't written by one Isaiah. It's a whole load of people. In fact, one of them got to 120 different Isaiahs. Because they said, it's, this is different. They looked at each bit. This is a different, someone different written that one. And they 120 different authors. Even nowadays, they say it's two or three different people wrote Isaiah. God has a sense of humour. The only scroll that came out of the Dead Sea Scrolls in one piece, Isaiah. So I think God was saying, yeah, one author. One author. Anyway, but this particular group <coughs> came up with this idea of Pauline Christianity. I was reading or listening to a, an Agatha Christie book the other day. And one of the characters was criticising Pauline Christianity. So it even got from these high-brow theologians into Agatha Christie. <laughs> and now there's a reason. Yeah. Which one was that? Um, that was three acts tragedy. Yeah. It's only a throwaway comment, but I say even a throwaway comment about Pauline Christianity. I think it's that one anyway. Is it? Um, what they were basically saying is that strict form of Christianity that Paul came up with, which was odd given he was being accused of not being strict enough by Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to some Jewish moral law, shall we? Leviticus. Leviticus. If you want a good day, turn to Leviticus. <laughs> And <coughs> chapter 20. Laws on morality, I've got here. Human sacrifice and immorality. Hmm. And I think it's the chapter 23. And I read this, see what the modern world would think. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, you shall also say to the sons of Israel, any man from the sons of Israel, or from the, or from the alien sojourner in Israel, who gives his offspring to Molech, that's it, a god, uh, shall surely be put to death. And people in the land shall stone him with stones. Uh, human sacrifices was to, to Molech. I will also set my face against that man. I will cut him off from amongst the people, because he has given his offspring to Molech, so as to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. If the people of the land, however, should ever disregard, uh, disregard that man when he has given his offspring to Molech, so, um, so as not to put him to death, then I will set my face against that man and against his family, and I will cut them off from amongst the people and from all who play the harlot after him by uh, playing the harlot after Molech. As the person who turns to mediums and spiritualists to play the harlot with them, I will also set my face against that person and cut them off from amongst the people. But you shall consecrate yourself, therefore, to be holy, for I am, I am the Lord your God. And you shall keep my statutes and practices when I, the Lord, who sanctify you. If there is anyone who curses his father or mother, you shall surely put them to death. For he has cursed his father and mother. His blood guiltiness is upon him. I don't think there'd be many kids left in schools nowadays. <laughs> if there is any man who commits adultery 
with another man's wife, the one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. There wouldn't be many adults around. If there is a man who lies with his father's wife, he has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. If there is a man who lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed uh, uh, incest. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. If there is a man who lies with a male, as those who lie with a woman, then both have committed a detestable act, and surely they shall be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. If there is a man who marries a woman and her mother, it is immoral, and they shall be uh, burned with fire, and there shall be be no immorality in your midst. If there is a man who lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to death. You shall also kill the animal. If there is a woman who approaches any animal to mate with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. If there is a man who takes his sister, uh, sister, his father's daughter, um, or his mother, mother's daughter, so as he sees her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness, it is a disgrace, and they shall be cut off in the sight of the sons of the people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness. He bears his guilt. I'll leave it there. Mm. 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 Aren't you glad we're in modern Christianity time now? Aren't you you glad that this doesn't apply to us anymore? (coughs) Turn to Romans chapter 1. Here's this troublemaker, Paul the Apostle. This one who's accused of... um, not following the, the Jewish law by the, the, by the um, Judaizers. <coughs> From verse 18 onwards of chapter 1 of Romans. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known of God is evident with them. For God has made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood though, um, through that which was made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honour him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolishness heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became full. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for the image and form of corruptible man and bird and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurities, that their bodies might be dishonoured amongst them. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. For this reason... God gave them over to deranging passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. In the same way, men also abandoned the natural functions of the woman and burning in their desire towards one another, men with men, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty for their errors. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind, and to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness and wickedness and greed and evil, full of murder, uh, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice and gossip, slanders and haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And though they knew the ordinances of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they did not only do the same, but also gave their hearty approval to those who practiced them. Yeah. Next to that, I put bishop's embarrassment. Mm. I wonder what a bishop would do if that came up in the lectionary reading. Especially that last verse, give hearty approval to those who practice them. 
This is the New Testament. This is this pain in the neck, Paul. But if you think this is just a one-off, now, to be honest, to understand this chapter, you have to understand the first eight chapters of Romans. You have to read them all together. Um, I'm not going to do it now, but some stage I probably will do it. It covers the whole... This is from the, the baseline going forwards. So you have to understand the rest of it to really understand this chapter. But nonetheless, he repeats it elsewhere. Let's go to 1 Corinthians again. To our wonderful, our wonderful muck-up church. <coughs> so 1, 1 Corinthians, it's chapter, nine, uh, chapter 6, it's verse 9 to 11. Oh. Oh, <laughs> or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were ye, some of you, but you have been washed and sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the Spirit of God. So we cannot, as Christians, just say, oh, it's all Old Testament stuff. Because here's Paul saying it in the New Testament. But the thing is, basically it is just Paul. If you read Peter's uh, letters or John's, he doesn't mention homosexuality or any of those things. And so people have said, actually, it's just Paul. It's just his interpretation. Did Jesus say a word about homosexuality? Did Jesus say it was sin? Can you think of any verse? And he let the adulterous woman off. And he spent his time with sinners. And go and do it no more. Yeah. Yeah. But someone who doesn't want to believe this could just look and say, well, actually, no, it's this, this poor guy. He's writing it in here. There's nobody else, it's just this Paul guy. And that's where they got the idea of Pauline Christianity being the bad guys. In fact, there's another one there I haven't read yet, which uh, I've got feminist enraged next to it. It's where Paul says, I will not suffer a woman to teach a man, but they must main, remain silent. I will not go into that one at the moment. <laughs> yeah, another time, okay, another time. You see what I mean? You see what I mean? <laughs> Surrounded by disobedient females, it's awful. Anyway, but there is a point to be made here that it's only Paul who really goes into this. And so if you can say something wrong with Paul, and I've been, I went to a church once, I was at canoeing, um, a canoe camping, and I went to this church in the middle of nowhere in the evening, um, average age over 90, um, most of the ladies asleep in the back, visiting preacher, reading one of these passages. He's got to this and went, of course we know Paul was sexist. And then carried on reading. <laughs> Did you uh, walk out? No, I didn't. I didn't no, at the time. That's later on. But it just... Throw away comic. Yeah, Paul was sexist. Paul was racist. Paul's a bigot. So you can't really take what Paul writes in here, can you? No, no, let's get rid of that. Um, there's, a, there's, yeah, there's a story about a, a minister who went to pray for a dying lady and he wanted her to read from her Bible so he picked up a Bible and he found those pages ripped out there was bits cut out and he said well, what's happened to your Bible he said oh that's every time in your sermon you've said that this bit shouldn't be in the Bible I cut it out <laughs> that's I mean that's what these German philosophers were doing they were saying this, this bit was put in later. This bit was made up later. This bit wasn't supposed to be there. This bit was corrupted. And they were supposed to be Protestant theologians. And that idea has come down. One of the purposes of the book of Acts is, a justifi uh, is it's to show the truth about all the things that happened, but specifically it is a defence of the Apostle Paul. Um, we're not going to read all these if you look at all the references in that um, table down there we're not going to read them all but what I want to show there's a deliberate 
symmetry in the Bible, uh, in the book of Acts, and it's what Luke deliberately put in there. So the symmetry is between Peter, the apostle to the, the, the Jews, and Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. So twice there is a record of them before the authorities and what they said. So they were standing. So Paul, interestingly, um, Paul the first time was before the Sanhedrin when he cured the man, the, the lame man. The second time was when they were dragged in later on. Um, with Paul, it's when he's before Felix and before Festus. This is everything. So both the time, and that's where they actually talk about the, the things that happened there. So they were standing before the authorities a lot more than that, but there's just two put in where they get, the, get to hear what they said. Both of them healed a lame beggar. Both of them healed in unusual ways. They put the sick out in the street so that if Peter walked past them, his shadow fell over the sick person and that person got better. In Paul's case, they took handkerchiefs, took snotty <laughs> handkerchiefs from his person, or sweaty handkerchiefs, and took it to the hill, sick and they got healed. Both of them, the spirit came by the laying on of their hands. Both of them were spoken to from heaven. Both of them received visions and guidance. Both of them took on magicians. So uh, Peter took on the one at Samaria, Simon the sorcerer. Um, and Paul took on one on Cyprus, which was Elimaeus, the magician. Both of them took on magicians. Both of them raised the dead. So Paul raised Tabitha. Oh, sorry, Peter raised Tabitha, I think it was. And Paul raised the, the boy who fell out. Uh, so he fell out the window because he got bored with the long sermon. <coughs> <coughs> now the room was hot. <laughs> That's why I sit in the window, yeah. Um, both of them have fights with Judaizers. So uh, Peter gets told off by the Judaizers when he comes back from having had dinner at um, a, centu a Roman centurion's house. And he has to sort of fight that out. And so does Peter. He has the, the fights with the Judaizers who come in and want to change the way the Gentile church is running. Both of them had miraculous escapes from prison. So Peter, if you remember, he was in prison between two guards. The angel came in, chains fell off, he, he led him outside. Paul was in a prison, singing praises. There was an earthquake, the chains fell off. He gets out. So both had in Bible cases. Sermons. There are seven sermons from each. One complete sermon from each and six partial sermons for each. So there's a, as you can see, this is deliberate. This isn't accidental. This is Luke defending his friend. In fact, in the, the book of Corinthians, if you go to 1 Corinthians, or we're in 1 Corinthians already, chapter 9, this is the rumours that were going round. And um, in Corinthians, they, they've written a letter to, to Paul, and they, they've put these things out. And this is one of the things he's saying, that they've said, and he's heard rumours about. I am not free. I am not an apostle. I have not seen Jesus, our Lord. Are you not the works? Uh, are you not my works in the Lord? And there's other places in Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, it's basically saying that people are accusing him of not being an apostle. An apostle is someone that Jesus has sent. And so if you think of when Paul was converted, Jesus said to him, I will send you to the Gentiles. I'm sending you. <coughs> Everyone said, no, Paul's not an apostle. No, he's not. He, 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 no, he's, just, he's just, a, just a preacher or whatever. You don't have to tell you any attention to him. So here's Luke saying, everything that Peter did, Paul did. They've got different jobs, but they're equal. They're not, not one's better, not the other. They're equal. They're both apostles. They're both being sent out. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Chapter 3 on here. Uh, I'm, look, I'm looking above, sorry. I missed one down. Oh, the okay. Christian walk. Okay. Ephesians 4, 17. This is... This is Paul's message. And if you think about the... the two, I didn't explain the two pictures above this before we look at it. You can see the, the, 
the Roman gladiator to start with. Paul is going into a Gentile world. Peter is going to a Jewish world, a Jewish world that already has the knowledge of the scripture. Paul is going into a Gentile world. In the Roman Empire, one of their own philosophers complains that you have to be vicious in order to survive. It doesn't matter what level of society, you could be the lowest slave or the highest emperor, if you're not vicious, you will not survive. Their idea of a good Sounds entertainment... Like Sounds like Hamas. Hmm. Yeah. Their idea of a good entertainment is going and watching people be slaughtered in various and amusing ways. And when they had a, a triumph, when some great general had come down, they would have all the people, the prisoners, chained to the back of his chariot, being dragged along. And at the end, they would all be taken into whatever, to Colosseum or wherever else at the time, and they would be a slaught, slaughtered in amusing ways to make the population really happy. And that's how they deal with other people. The only time they would show clemency to anybody was if it was good for them. So if they've utterly humiliated somebody, and that person groveled publicly to them, and everybody could see this person, oh yes, I forgive you, you're forgiven, off you go. Of course, when they're at the back, knife in the ribs, but it was only publicly. So they, they, they put clemency and high up on the list, but only publicly. Whereas you've got the message of Jesus that Peter was taking, which is love your enemy. Do good to those who persecute you. Care for the poor, for the widow. So here's Peter trying to take the, or sorry, Paul, taking the message out to the Roman world. The message of Jesus, which is utterly opposed to the principle of the Roman Empire. Now the other picture there, this is one of the cleaner ones I could have got from um, Greek art. The way of the Greeks. Um, so the words from Plato, a superior form of love compared to the love of women. There was a tradition, have you heard of a, squ a squire in this country? A, 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 ch a child from one manor would be sent to another higher ranking official and he would learn his squire craft, his knight craft, from that official. And that's what's called a squire. They had a similar system in the Greek world where someone would be sent from a lower, um, lower household to some higher Greek. And he would learn how to be a um, man with a Greek. Part of that involved having sex with a man. And it would always have to be with a young, beautiful boy. When they were, when they were grown up, that was, men to men, that was bad. No, that wasn't good. But men to young boys, that was okay. That was, that was, look, that was a, not every area in Greek... So Sparta, for instance, which was the big, hard, tough town, was big into this, whereas Athens wasn't. And so they were all the different um, Greek states. But it became known in Rome as the way of the Greeks, which was basically having sex with children or boys. So that, although it wasn't officially... It, it was officially frowned on in the Roman world, but nonetheless it was endemic. There's a book called, written by Suetonus, a Roman historian, called The Twelve Caesars. And I read it years ago. At least ten out of the twelve Caesars were rampant homosexuals. And so it's through all levels of society. And they didn't see anything wrong with it. So here's Paul taking the gospel to a Roman world, to a Greek world. Of course he's going to mention it. Whereas Peter and James and John are going to a Jewish world where they know the rules. They may not follow them, but they know the rules. So they don't need to mention them because it's already there. So this is what I've put as a frame of reference. <coughs> There's a frame of reference. If you're going to a world where these things are normal, and you're going to say, in fact, let's read it in Ephesians. Where are we in Ephesians? This is the message that Paul is taking to the Gentile world. Uh, so it's 17 to 32. I say therefore and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their minds, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of their ignorance that is, uh, that is in them, therefore of the hardness of their hearts. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality, and the practices of every kind of impurity and greediness. 
And you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard of him and have been taught in him just as truth in Jesus Christ. That in reference to your former manner of life, you laid aside the old self with all its corruptions in accordance with the lust and deceit, and that you were the renewal of your spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, and has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speaking the truth to one another with your neighbours, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Let him who steals steal no longer, but rather let him labour and perform with his own hands what is good, in order that he may have something to share with him who has a need. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, only such is good for edification according to the needs of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of your redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and slander be put away from you along with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ forgave you. That's the message he was preaching to the Roman Gentile world, utterly opposed to what they were living in. So of course he has to take it on head on. Of course he has to say these things. But it does mean that it's just Paul that the enemy has to deal with. If Paul can undermine, or if Satan can undermine Paul, if he can persuade people that what Paul has written is bigoted and and sexist and not relevant, then he can win. And so the book of Acts is actually written by God through Luke as a defence of Paul. So that the writings of Paul, who more than anyone else shaped, apart from Jesus, shaped Christianity. More than anybody else. We have to rush through these last bits. In the, the Last Supper, Jesus said to his disciples, I have got so much more to tell you, but you're not up to it yet. But when the Spirit comes, he will teach you these things. So there was more to come. And he said, there's more stuff to come, but I can't tell you. But when the Holy Spirit comes, you will know it. In Ephesians, actually as we're in Ephesians, let's turn it up. Chapter 3, 1 to 13. This is Paul talking to the Ephesians about what he's doing effectively. For this this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, for your sake, uh, you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard the stewardship of God's grace, which has been given to me for you, that by revelation was made known to me the mysteries, as I wrote before briefly. Mysteries. In in the New Testament, that's a, a technical word that means something that wasn't revealed previously, that has been revealed now. So there's mysteries been revealed to Paul. Uh, By reference to these, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mysteries of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, but now has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. You notice there, it's not merely just to him, it's to the other apostles as well. (coughs) But Paul is the one that those mysteries have been recorded by. He's the, 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 the intelligent, organised brain that puts it down and organises it into such a way. We won't read the rest of it now. Paul, at one stage, actually goes to Jerusalem. And he goes to... Because he, he's worried. I've, I've been taught all these things. God's told me these things. Am I wrong, though? And he actually goes up to Jerusalem and he goes to Peter, to John, to James, and he lays out everything he's taught them. And they go, yep, no problems, fine by us. So what's written down here has been okayed by Peter, Paul, James and the other apostles. So it's not something he's just made up. And that's recorded in Acts and in Galatians. 
Let's go to 2 Peter. So it's 2 Peter 3, and it's 14 to 18. Therefore, beloved, since you look for the things, be diligent to be found by them in peace, spotless and blameless. And regard the practices of our Lord to be salvation, just as also our beloved Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, who wrote to you. As also in all his letters, speaking to them of things which are some, sometimes hard to understand. I get amused there because I get the feeling <coughs> Peter can be scratching his head. What's he writing about? Which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do the rest of Scripture. So he's actually calling the writings of Paul Scripture. As they do to their own destruction. So here's Peter, the head of the church, saying, yes, the writings of Paul are Scripture. And people distort them to their own damage. This is the writing of God. Let's flip over a page to John. I put this in because it's one of my favourite passages and it was just a page over, but it's also, I think, it's about truth. So 1 John 5, sorry, 1 John 1 5. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we walk in the light, we, uh, he himself is in the light and we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteousness to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. We are supposed to walk in the light. Luke was trying to show the truth. He was trying to show the world that this is the truth. The truth in, in his gospel, this is the truth about Jesus. In Acts, this is the truth about what the, the apostles were doing, what they were preaching. We are now at a point where truth, what is truth? What is truth? Did God really say? Did Jesus really say? The book of, the book of Acts is about truth. It's about showing, it's about defending Paul, it's about defending the, the apostles, showing the truth. They weren't perfect, but when you see the truth, you know. And that is what we are hopefully going to be looking at, the truth of the gospel. Yeah. So we'll just finish there. Any questions I fear to ask? <laughs> list. List of so we'll finish with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you that you sent your son to show us the truth in this world of lies. Lord, give that light in our hearts and in our minds. Lord, and show us how to show the world that light, that they may see the difference between the truth and the lies. Lord, this is a darkening world, and it needs you more than ever. Lord, be with us and be, show yourself through us. Amen. Amen. And amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.